Welcome back to the Aerospace Executive Podcast. I am I'm here with David Kamovitz. David is the founder and CEO of Setna IO, which is a, a fast growing player in the aircraft parts and now aircraft and engine leasing arena. So David's up in Chicago. It's exciting what he's been doing with his business and appreciate you having coming on today. Thanks, Craig. I uh, appreciate the opportunity to come on and chat with you. I know you've built a really cool business yourself, and I'm uh, excited to, uh, to chat with you and let you know a little bit about myself and, and set now and what we've been doing. It's, it's been a lot of fun. Yeah, no. Hey, look, your story is great. You and I got introduced, and you, you told me about your story. And yeah, you, you came up for pretty humble. Uh, you got a humble start in this industry, and now here you are running a, a $300 million business with a beautiful office space uh, in the suburbs of Chicago. How'd you get here? It really is a pretty interesting entrepreneurial story. Uh, I'm going to go all the way back. So I, I was at Indiana University. And I was in the business school and I was running some entrepreneurial businesses at school. I had 30 vending machines and I was making really good money for a college students. And I saw my peers who were in the business school there as well. And they were going and taking jobs at KPMG and PwC for, at the time, 50, 55,000 a year. And I was making something like that in college with my vending machine business. And I said, I don't think this corporate path is, is going to be right for me. I'm going to try to find something different. And I'm going to keep my eyes open for opportunities and, and try to find something that's just different than the other people at the time. And so senior year rolls around and I learned about the energy deregulation business in Illinois. So basically, this business was you could go and purchase your utilities from a third party at a competitive rate and save some money. And so the, the deregulation in Illinois happened right around 2008. So I, I, was, I started this business in 2009, and we were one of the first entrants into that market. Somebody tried to hire me to do this job, and I said, I don't think I need to work for this business. I don't think they add a lot of value. I think I can do this on my own. And... Uh, senior year, we applied to get a, a, a license from the Illinois Commerce Commission to go and start this electricity consulting brokerage business, which we were able to get. And I signed up contracts with about eight different electric suppliers. I ended up getting an energy efficient lighting supplier as well. And then I went and I market, marketed this under my own little business that I started. I would go and knock on doors of industrial businesses, real door-to-door -door sales, knocking on warehouses and industrial buildings, trying to sell to them. And the summers prior to that, I'd worked for my mom, who's an industrial real estate broker, and she would have me knock on doors and I, I found deals. So this was this is a legitimate way of meeting people and making things happen. And so I did this for a couple of years and the business was, it actually was pretty successful. It's all relative, of course. It was definitely no Setna, but... I, I did really well with it for being 22, 23, 24. My, after my second full year of doing this after college, there were some changes in the market. And although I was making one hundred and twenty dollars or $130,000 a year, which for a 23 or 24-year-old, that, that's really good, I saw that the market was changing. It was becoming much more competitive, and it was tough to really add a lot of value to my customers. And so even though I was doing well by what most people would consider at the time. I said, this isn't right for me and I need to find something different. I knocked on Prime Air store. They're a parts broker, part of the Heiko business, of the Heiko group here in Chicago. I sold him, I sold that company some electricity and some light bulbs. And then he says, hey, you seem like you might be smart. Why don't you, why don't you take a look at what we're doing over here? And uh, the CEO, he showed me the spreadsheet, the parts they were buying and selling and what they were doing. And they were buying parts for 20000 and selling it for 40000 And I'm here negotiating at tenth of a penny per kilowatt hour. And I said, okay, I think what this guy's doing over here seems better. Two and a half years of running this energy business, which again, was reasonably successful. I walked away from it, started as a sales assistant at Prime Air. Mm -hmm. And I, I, as soon as I got into this business, my second week, I, I fell in love with it. I said, this is unbelievable. And I started to really... You know, understand what the market was and, and what the dynamics were and, and who you could buy from and who you could sell to and how you could repair the parts. And I put in a little bit over two years there. I didn't have a tremendous amount of experience, but I put in about two years. And to me, it wasn't about making all the connections that I needed or, or learning everything that I needed to learn. It was about learning 
what I needed to ask, what questions I needed to, to, to ask and what I needed to look for. And I definitely learned that over there. Barry Cohen, he's, he was the CEO at the time when I worked there, really sharp guy. And I learned a lot from him. I think what questions to ask him, how to look at things. And I noticed from my second week that there was always a lack of in stock, ready to go serviceable material at a reasonable price. So there were Ezra parts sitting around there. There were some ready to go parts that were marked up at a, a huge number compared to some of the ready to, some of the as we move parts. And I said, okay, if you proactively go out, understand every single line item on every single aircraft, understand what the demand is, do the market on every part, then you can build a supply chain that proactively manages all of these components through repair shops, through the as move process to getting them tagged, then you have everything ready to go. And then you can probably build a, a real business by doing this. <laughs> and 2016, I, I started setting up. I reached out to a good friend of mine at the time, uh, a gentleman named Jason Cozen, and he said, hey, come and sit down with me and my dad and talk about starting this business together. So I sat down with them and they, uh, they run an industrial group here in Chicago, wire manufacturer, zinc recycling, Similar trading businesses that have nothing to do with aviation, but have the same basic features that our business has, understanding commercial banking, setting up systems to, to process orders, trading. Um, so they said, hey, we're gonna, we'll, we'll start the business with you. We'll fund you. We have 40 years of banking relationships that we can you know, open you up to, and we'll fund the business and we'll, we'll help you get going. And so they're still my partners today. They own half the business. I own the other half of the business. And it's been an unbelievable partnership where I never would have been able to do what I've been able to do without them and vice versa. They built a, a company with me that's tremendously valuable. So it was really uh, an amazing meeting how that relationship has worked out over time. So we started in 2016. The first part that we bought, I bought a fire extinguisher for 400 bucks and I sold it for $800. So that was the genesis of Setna. Is, is really humble beginnings, hustling deal by deal, line item by line item. And that mentality of trying to maximize the dollar on every single last piece that comes off that aircraft and through that entire value stream, we're trying to maximize across the board with that attention to detail. That's what's propelled us to, to where we are today. And we haven't lost focus on that at all. So yes, we have close to 200 employees now, Yes, we've done $300 million of sales in the last year and we're running an MRO and we're leasing aircraft and engines. We're doing all this, this big business, but at the same time, we've never lost focus on those little parts and capturing every last dollar of value across the supply chain. And that's really been the differentiator of what's made us super successful over the last eight years. I love it. That's a hell of a, it's a great story of entrepreneurial spirit. Um. But I love the fact that you went from zero in 2016 with a partner and a $400 fire extinguisher to where you are now. Yes. Uh, yeah. And 200 employees. Just hiring 200 employees in itself is a <laughs> challenge. It, it definitely is. And if you look at Setna today, the reason that I think that we're such a special company is because we built a really a culture here that's different than most other places. And we've done a great job of aligning the incentives of the company and the people who work at the company. Yes, I know a lot about aircraft parts and trading. I understand a lot of it, but the team that we have here is unbelievable. And the people, we have 15 people here that could be running their own $20 million, $50 million parts company. But instead of doing that, they're here at Setna because of the way that we compensate them, the way that we've aligned the incentives and the way that we've built the business. So. It really is a testament to the people that we've been able to recruit and retain over the years. We've had nearly zero attrition of any of our real value add trading people over time. So the, re the retention here of the people that really drive the business is, is no one's, you ask around the industry, there's not a lot of X set in the people that are out there that are, that are driving major business units forward anywhere else at this time. It's nice not to have. So... You guys are in a lot of different products lines. You have a huge warehouse space you guys just moved into. You bought a lot of real estate up there. <laughs> you know, narrow body, wide body, regional jet, a little bit of everything. How are you segmenting out what your business is going to focus on? Sure. So we're not really, we, we don't, we're not product uh, focused by any means in terms of 
aircraft that we're going after or engines that we're going after. To me, it goes back to what I learned, started learning my second week and the business as a sales assistant. And it's all about the patterns and the patterns that make an HBT blade an attractive part. They also make a transceiver an attractive part or they make them or, or they make something a non-attractive part that doesn't have any value. So for us, we're out looking at every deal, every opportunity. We've purchased aircraft, ATR 72s with engines, all the way up through A380s with engines and literally every commercial aircraft in between. So for us, being product focused would really pigeonhole us into chasing deals that we might not like if in a market we think gets overheated or becomes super challenging. Maybe you're only winning one out of 20 bids on a challenging product type, but on a less challenging product type that's not as competitive, maybe we're winning one out of two bids or one out of three bids. And the fact that we're able to go after everything and look at everything agnostically, that's really been a huge driver of growth for us. If we were only in the CFM 56, 7B market, yeah, that's the hottest stuff. It's the best material. It's the easiest to move, but it's also the most competitive and it's the most challenging to win bids on. So I would say if we're bidding on a, a 7B, we're winning one out of 20. But if we're bidding on an A380, we're winning every other A380 that we try to buy or, or every third A380 because it's such a weird niche product and it's very expensive to disassemble and it's hard to, it's unwieldy. They're just tough. They're tough products to deal with. But in those products, if you've built out your supply chain and you're looking at things in the right way, you can find a lot of value to them over time if you are looking at risk uh, appropriately. Yeah. I, I, what's interesting, we're on the street of this and you tell me if it's true or not. One of the successes, one of the major successes of the company is that you look personally at every deal. I look at, oh, I, in terms of an asset acquisition, I'm 100% looking at every deal. But even more than that, I'm looking at almost every sales order that goes out the door of the company. And I'm looking at almost every line item of inventory that comes into the company. So per day, that could be 500 line items of inventory coming in. And it could be, there's hundreds, on an average day, we'll see 100 sales orders and they often have multiple lines on them. And I'm definitely watching them like a hawk almost every day. And if I'm not watching it, then one of my other top guys is, is watching it very intently. So there's not much that slips by here. We're not giving parts away. Or we're not overpricing or underpricing. We try to be right where we need to be to keep things moving while also maximizing our, our ability to generate margin. So yes, I'm very locked into the business. And we've built great tech systems that allow us to do this really effectively where, yes, I have to work hard, of course, but it's not like I'm not working 16 hours a day. I work a normal amount of time that a CEO who's really bought into their company is working. It's a lot, but it's less than an investment banking analyst is going to be working in Wall Street by a lot. Yeah, I got you. Who are you hiring? You talk about entrepreneur. You've got a reputation out there for being very entrepreneurial. Um, you know, you're right. Not a lot of turnover. Mm -hmm. But on the flip side, too, you're bringing a lot of new people into the industry. What are some traits you're looking for in a in a fast moving, highly caffeinated parts trading company? That's a great question. It, it's really so. If you're bringing somebody on who's not from the industry, it's extremely challenging to sit down with somebody and and understand if they're going to actually be good at the business. Uh, to be honest, I haven't really cracked hiring new people. And I can sit down. I, it's not like I can sit down with somebody for 10 minutes and say, okay, this person is going to be good or not. Because being a good parts trader is, it's not like you have to be a great salesman. Yes, you need to be a good salesman to be able to build relationships. But if you're a great salesman and you can build relationships, but you can't recognize patterns and you can't quickly sift through data and understand what a real opportunity is and what a, a real opportunity isn't and, and where to focus your time, then you're not going to be great. So you can be the best ad sales guy in the world or the greatest car salesman in the world. And you come over to set and to trade parts and you can't crack it because you can't see the patterns you can't pick up on, on how to actually find value. On the flip side, you could have the most brilliant person in the world that could pick up on every pattern. They could be an ace chess player and they can look through data really quickly and totally understand what's going on, but they don't have the ability to follow through. They don't have the ability to, to work with other people. They don't have the ability to communicate or build relationships. And so that person also probably won't be very successful in this business. So we're looking for people that have the ability to communicate and create relationships, but that can also understand data and read between the lines, pick up on things quickly and, and take advantage of opportunities when they see them. So sitting down with somebody and interviewing them to try to understand who that person is, is very challenging. 
And honestly, if we're hiring entry-level people, it's more of you tell us you want to work here, you reach out to us. We need somebody for our role today. We'll give you a shot, probably. We'll give you a couple interviews. We'll give you a shot. And it may or may not work out. We'll know after a few months, but it's really hard to tell just from interviewing somebody if they're going to be a good parts writer or not. I got you. Yeah, it's a fascinating. It's interesting. You guys, your business is trading. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, stocks, bonds, aircraft parts. Mm-hmm. The market that's moving so fast right now, and, and as it is with a lot of COVID and the post-COVID kind of craziness, how do you maintain your discipline? On you, you obviously are looking at Jeep gross profit or some sort of ROI. Sure. How do you manage to keep your discipline in a market that's really moving so fast and has been so chaotic the last couple of years? Sure. That that's a great question. We've grown really quickly, and I'm sure there is people out there that think that we're we're crazy and we're doing when we bought the A380s in 2021. People are like, what are these guys doing? They're nuts. So people have always thought that we've done things in a, in a different kind of crazy way. But maintaining discipline, we've done that from the very beginning when we started the company. When we were buying a part, we called every person that listed that part on ILS. We really knew what it was worth and what was out there. And so that's in our DNA. That's what we've done from the very beginning of the company. So when we're out doing deals, we're not speculating that we might make money or that parts might go up in value. We're looking for net present value that we can find today. And if you look at what happened during COVID, everybody was exposed for what they had going on and how they were running their business. And a lot of companies that were the industry leaders in December 2019, they're not the industry leaders anymore. And it's because they had inventory problems and they were lying to themselves about what their inventory was actually worth. And when you go into a major downturn, everybody sees if the emperor has clothes on or not. And we had our clothes on and we were able to get through 2020 and still have operating income that was positive every single month uh, of that year. Even with the sales decline of 80% from January to June, we're still able to maintain positive operating income because we cut our expenses and we had a lot of inventory that we were able to move that had the right cost position on it when we were able to sell, even though it was very challenging. So that's in our DNA. We've never been crazy speculators out like, betting that something is going to go up in value. That's how we do it. We say, okay, if we do this deal and we put 600 parts on an aircraft teardown or a thousand parts or 1500 parts through the supply chain and manage that, we can come up with enough value to find a significant return on that deal through the value add services that we provide and through the customer base that we have. We have 1500 unique customers and a thousand unique vendors. And when you put all this work together, we're able to find returns that are, are very attractive and that have been working for us over and over again. And we wouldn't we wouldn't have the financials that we have. We wouldn't have the commercial bank syndicate that we put together if the numbers weren't what they were. And so at the end of the day, they look at what are your inventory returns? What's your debt to EBITDA ratio? And ours are excellent and they're going to remain excellent moving forward. So we definitely see deals where we think we could go after them and there's still probably a decent return on them, but we walk away from a ton of deals and other people win them even when we have last look. Being disciplined is just in our DNA and we know what a serious downturn looks like and you don't want to be caught in one of those downturns with inventory that's underwater because you will be recapitalized and you'll be nuked. Leverage is not your friend. In that- not, not in that situation. Not in that situation. It's not, no. I remember talking to Sam Maida at Raytheon, and they right before COVID, they just bought an A380 for teardown. Oh, God. And I think they bought two of them. I wonder what they paid for them. I don't know, but I think they, they were, Sam's not at Raytheon anymore. He's, uh, he's, I think he's down at L3 Harris now. But I remember that other publicly traded company who, that had just bought two A380s, and they're looking at this thing going, what, what's next? Yeah, patience for the right people can be your, can be your friend. Yeah. Yeah. So, and we, yeah. And we bought all, all the three days that we've purchased. They've been post lockdown. I'm sure the cost position is significantly different. I look at the, the 787s that just got bought for Terra. Sure. Sure. And I think that's a big bet. That's a very big bet. Not one I'd be, yeah. That's a big bet. That, you you got to be comfortable making that bet. So, I agree. So uh, I think that's a very interesting business model. The first, couple have started. Um, 
I would imagine the first couple are going to do extremely well. It's going to be the sixth, the seventh, the eighth that the sellers are going to be expecting to sell them at the price the last one sold at. Mm-hmm. And somebody will probably buy them. It probably won't be Setna. And you saw what happened to these companies that, that were the 12th or 15th, triple seven, 200 ER. They came in and they put huge book values on flight controls and other parts that if you're the first one, you can sell them and you're probably good. But if you're doing the 15th one, the value might drop off by 90% or something like that. So I would imagine that the people who are buying the 787s are going to do really right now. And I would imagine that the 15th or the 12th guy to jump into that business, if they're still paying what the guys are paying for them today, that might be a scary place to be. And it's also a tough supply chain to manage too, because you're, a lot of stuff is OEM only. And so a lot of what we're trading, we can find third parties to do the repair work at large discounts to what the OEMs are charging. 787 is, it's really interesting. We definitely trade in 787 parts. It's definitely a couple percentage points of our business, but to go out and buy a full aircraft today for 80 million or 100 million or 70 million or whatever the number is, I'm sure that people can do it and, and make a lot of money with it. But I, I would be very, personally, I would just be very cautious with it. But I think it's an interesting business case. And I'm sure the people that have purchased those deals will do extremely well. And right it's, fa- it's just fascinating to me. It's, uh, yeah, it's a fun industry to watch. You're 36 year old CEO. Yeah. yeah. Has its advantages. What, yeah. Uh, and you got a lot of confidence in your team. Uh, yeah, your, your team is absolutely you know, you're loving the environment up there. Is it? Yeah. What were the hard lessons you had to learn along the way? The hard lessons I had to learn over the way. Okay. So I definitely, I'm st- I still act immature sometimes for sure. I can be a little hot headed. I can say things that I shouldn't say. I, we've been successful. So trying to not be, trying to maintain confidence, but not be completely cocky. Obviously when you've had the success that we've had, Trying to keep your ego in check is tough. Knowing that I'm I'm regularly wrong, I make the wrong decisions on a regular basis. That's something that you have to know. And and when you make a mistake, you have to own up to it and move on from it. So that's a huge thing. But it's been a crazy voyage, and I've grown so much in the last eight years. When I started the company, when I was 28, now I'm 36. You know, I'm excited to see where I'm going to be in eight more years and what who I will become in eight years because I'm I'm definitely an imperfect person and I definitely do things that I say and I'm like, why would I have said that? That was not cool. And I know that I shouldn't have and I try to learn from it and sometimes I do and sometimes I do the same dumb thing again. So <laughs> it's it's all just part of being a person. I think that's I think that's everybody though, right? But yeah, I'm sure I think that's everybody. But yeah, you've hired a good team. You got to bank your relationships. You've obviously you've got you think about the steps along the way from a small business to where you're at now. Is it? Yeah. It's been crazy. It's been crazy. <laughs> I can tell you the hardest day that I was here at Set None and by far. I it was it, it was December of or sorry, it was February of twenty twenty. I had a uh, pretty major neck surgery. Days later, I got extraordinarily sick. I had a major infection in my neck, like a a staph infection in my neck from the surgery. I was rushed to the hospital. I was in the hospital for over a week. I had a second emergency surgery to clean it out. I was on drugs that they were giving me. I had a tube in my arm for these antibiotics that I was on to clear out this infection for two months after. And it was May 5th and Donald Trump comes out with the, the travel ban from Europe. And I said, okay, I called, I talked about Jason, my partner who I started with, I called his dad, who's, he, I think he owns 1% of the company, but he's like our, he's like my advisor and one of my very close friends. And I look at him also a second father at this point, he's a great guy. I called him and I'm freaking out. I'm on drugs too. So I'm not even thinking clearly because I'm like getting out of the hospital that day. I'm like, okay. If we like what we have to do something really drastic right now because we just shut down travel to Europe. There's these lockdowns going on. They're starting in China. Like what well, this is gonna happen here. If you can't go to Europe, what like what what's gonna happen here? Nobody's gonna be able to pay their bills to us. We're gonna have huge problems. We're not gonna be able to sell any parts. This is gonna be crazy. And we talked for a while. And that day I said, okay, I'm going to cut everybody's commission. I'm gonna cut my salary to zero and I'm gonna lay off a third of the company tomorrow. And 
that's what we did. And I was extremely emotional when I did this. It was a horrible time. And we took early action. It was March 5th. So nobody was laying people off yet. Nobody was going through that. The people laid people off in June. But because we took early and really significant action right away, we told our banks what we were doing. You know, we laid people off through no fault of their own. Because we did that, we had the foresight of what was going to happen and we were able to get through it without losing money. Had we not done that, we would have lost money for five, six months in a row and we would have had problems with our banks. And then we would not have been able to go out and invest in the deals we started investing in aggressively in July of 2020. And we wouldn't be where we're at today. Like when I look back at my, really when I look back at my life and like defining moments of making like a tremendously challenging decision, I go back to that and say, okay, I did something that felt horrible to me at the time. I, I let people go. They lost their jobs. It was horrible. I didn't pay myself. All my guys, they all took cuts who, who didn't get fired. And I look back at that and I said, okay, I, I made the right decision. It was a hard decision. It was a, an emotional decision, but it was the right decision. And had I not made that decision then, I can tell you for sure I would not be sitting here today. Yeah. Yeah. Look, that's... Uh that's the, it's lonely at the top. That's uh, it, it, it's lonely at the top and you have to make the hard decisions and firing people is never easy. No matter especially what, when, especially it's when, when it wasn't their fault. Like we said, we had to do it. Had to. It's, it's a crappy feeling and I totally get it. And, but I remember that, that day too. I can't, I went home to my wife. I say, we might as well just take a year off because it's going to be something. Mm -hmm. And uh, you bear down. Who do you use? Yeah. You talked about a fellow who owns you know, a, little, a little piece of your company. Who do you lean to when it's lonely at the top? Who do you lean to for trusted advice? I, I really rely on my team here. I'm the CEO and I'm the primary owner of the company, but the guys that I work with, I look at them as equals. I, I don't, it's not like I'm the CEO and they have to do what I say. A lot of them know a lot more than I do about a lot of things. And so I can really rely on my team, five or six or seven of the guys who I've worked with for a long time. I can really rely on them. My partner, Jason, who I started the business with, is a great advisor. His father, David, who I just mentioned, is a great advisor. My parents are successful business people. Look, Ben, my dad's been running a scrapyard on the west side of Chicago for almost 50 years now. So he's been doing that for a long time. And he's had a lot of ups and downs over the years. I grew up around, around business people. And I'm lucky that I've always had, had a good network of people around me that I can run ideas off of. And it's re but it's really the team around me. And I don't look at myself like I'm smarter than all of them because I'm not. Yeah. You know, it's, yeah. Look, it's nice to be able to have, you know, have people you can go to and go, all right, this sucks. What, what do you suggest? And they give you the unvarnished, they give you the unvarnished for sure. And that's only been, listen, those hard times have only been, that's been a small part of what we've done. Most of it's been pretty good times, but those hard times they'll make you and I'll remember them forever. I, I love it. We'll go one more direction here. You're moving yep. to the parts business and you're, you got two airplanes under LOI. Yep. You started your leasing business. I saw the headlines yep. in uh, Aviation Week today. Exciting times for you. Yes. Really, we built out our parts trading business, which is, in my opinion, best in class. We built out our component MRO business, Setnix, which is run by my partner, Robert James, who I started with at Setna from day one, along with Jason. He's been a, a tremendous piece of the puzzle that we built here. He's a technical expert and he's built a world-class shop down in Arizona. And we're moving to a much larger facility there later this summer, which is exciting. But we've built, we've built the MRO piece. We built the parts trading business. And so now we're going to try to capture more of that, of the value of these assets. And if we can get into them five years earlier, there's a lot more value that we can realize by, by getting into the space earlier. We can control the part supply at, at disassembly. We can control the MRO side internally. So we're probably one of the only companies in the world that is now out buying aircraft with four or five years of lease term remaining. Uh, running a, a, an elite parts trading business and also running an elite MRO and doing it all in-house with our own balance sheet and our own capital. We're not fundraising. We're not going out to capital markets for this. This is us reinvesting the profits that we've earned over time and buying into what we think is going to be a really bright future for both Setna and the industry at large. There's, a, there's an underlying narrative that are, are a, a, a hypothesis that I have that I think is going to really play out here. And I'm not sure that the rest of the industry is 
really understands it, assuming I'm right, the way that, that I think that I believe, the way that I think things are going to play out. If right now everybody knows about the supply chain issues and engine manufacturers are having problems delivering aircraft and the gear turbo fan and Boeing, the door and the Max and everything else, and the 787. But I think that the general consensus is that it's going to clear up in the next couple, two years, three years, it'll clear up and that we might be in a bubble right now and the bubble is going to pop and things will go back to normal. I, I don't agree with that at all. I think that there is a long-term supply shortage of aircraft. Um, and so if you look at Boeing's commercial uh, aircraft forecast in 2016, they expected uh, 20 years later for there to be 40,000 commercial aircraft uh, needed by the global fleet to support cargo and passenger operations. And so let's assume that number is correct. 2019, the max issue happens. Boeing delivers half as many narrow bodies as they expected in 2019. They're making planes, but they're sitting on the ground. They're not being delivered. And then they stop production. 2020, a lockdown start. Boeing and Airbus deliver very few aircraft. 21, same thing. 22, they restart building aircraft again. Now we're two years after the lockdowns really ended. And we're still significantly below production rates that were expected in 2016 by Boeing and Airbus because of all the issues that are ongoing. Mm -hmm. And so we're say that people are right and that the supply chains do normalize in two or three years and aircraft deliveries come back to normal. Say that happens. Okay, fine. Even if that happens, you're going to have had eight years where you've had production fall significantly short of what was expected to be demanded by the global fleet. So what does that mean? That means that if you have an eight-year issue and you're 20 or 30% below what was what should have been made, those planes are never going to be made. They're never going to exist. You can't just increase production. You're going to have a long-term supply shortage. Yeah. So where in my short business career have I seen something similar? We saw that something similar happen in 2008 with real estate. So real estate collapses in 2008. You can't get lending. Nobody's building anything. And there's very little building going on for... 2008 through 2012, there's you know five years of, of very little building. Building an apartment building or an industrial building is much easier than building an aircraft. And so what happened from 2013 through now in the real estate market globally, you've seen prices go through the roof. And, it's, and in my opinion, it's not really because of interest rates or, or anything like that. It's because of a supply shortage. And again, building a building is much less supply chain constrained than building an aircraft. So bottom line, we've seen massive increases in real estate because of a lack of building. And I'm confident that aviation is going to have the same exact thing play out, but it's going to be even more exacerbated because you will not be able to add more aircraft to the global fleet. So this isn't like an issue that's going to go away in two or three years. This is an issue that's going to be ongoing for 20 years. This is a 20 year issue that we have set ourselves up for. And unless there's a new aircraft manufacturer that comes out, sets up a line, gets approved by the FAA and delivers thousands of aircraft, I don't really see how my thesis doesn't come true. No, so, yeah, I, I think you're, yeah, that's unique. I was talking to some bankers a couple of weeks ago and they're like, when does Boeing become investable? I'm like, now, now. It's on his it's on his blood. But you think about your know, max production is down to under 30 aircraft a month. Mm -hmm. Airbus is producing, but everything that's coming off with a gear turbofan engine is sitting. So they're not getting delivered until those issues are done. But you're not, you're right. And it's not like you could turn that switch on and have a 60 aircraft max production rate tomorrow. You just don't have the people. You can't. And so bottom line is you will be in an aircraft shortage. I'm confident to say there will be an aircraft shortage 15 years from today because of the issues that started five, six years ago. It's not a short-term thing. So bottom line, if we can go out and buy aircraft, it's probably going to be a bet that will work out pretty well from us. I love it. You have a, you have a, you take it as it goes or you have a fleet size in mind or what, what's, is the goal world domination? Yeah. Yeah. It's world domination. I love it. Now, I, uh, listen, we're, we're going to, we're going to go out and we're going to do deals that we think make sense for us. We're again, we're not going out and fundraising. So obviously we're not going to become air camp, but we're going to go out and we're going to invest our own money and we have sizable, we have sizable profitability coming into the business and I'm going to pretty much invest as much as I can in this thesis and go for it.
I got to think you're being approached by a lot of people saying, hey, David, let us be your partner or let you buy, let us buy you out. Is it, yeah, are yeah. You gonna, are you, is it never going to be never? Or is it, hey, yeah, if the right deal came along, we think about it, but we're going to think about it pretty hard. Yeah, we're approached by people constantly. That's not something that we want to do. It's for me, I, if I sold the company now at a discount, I, I would have enough where I wouldn't need to work again. So you look at yourself and say, why am I getting up every day? Why am I doing this? What's the point if it's not really for money anymore? And so I do it for fun. I do it because I love my team. I love building something together. I'm fired up every time we do a deal. Every time we sell a $6,000 actuator, like I love it. I get excited. I look at it. I don't know. I just love it. So for me to go and sell the company for money, what's why would I do that? I can already do what I want to do. That That's not really something that we're looking at right now. I'm not saying that we'll never sell the company. It could happen, but I, 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 it feels very unlikely that we would be going down that path anytime in the near future because we're having fun. And I want to see how big and successful we can make the company and what difference we can make in the lives of the people that are on the team that are in our space. I love it. That's great. So thanks for coming on today. Let's, uh, let's leave it there and I'll look forward to having you back on. All right. When I, that, when I see that lease portfolio up to 100 some airplanes, I'm going to really look forward to that conversation. So, hey, don't count us out. We'll see what we can pull off. I, I love it. I love it. I love the energy. Congratulations on the new spaces up there. It's beautiful. Love what, what you guys are doing. So, thanks for coming on, David. Yeah. Thank you for uh, spending your time with me this morning. It's an honor to be on the show and I uh, really appreciate everything. Congratulations on all your success. Cheers. I hope you enjoyed the latest edition of the Aerospace Executive Podcast. You can reach out to me directly, Craig at NorthStarESG.com, or check us out at www.NorthStarESG.com. You can subscribe to this podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, Podbean, or on YouTube. Just do a search for Aerospace Executive Podcast. Thanks again. I'm Craig Pippen.